So, Jerome, we'd like to welcome you to the group. And since you can't hear me, I'll IM you and let you know. Okay. okay. Great. I am so glad to be with you guys today. Um, a little nervous, but we'll work through all of that energy. I am going to maximize the presentation. So if you have questions, I don't think I'll be able to see them until the end because my box is covered up. I'm in the process of trying to log in via my phone just so I can have another um, window and potentially be able to hear folks if they start talking. So um, please excuse me if I'm not responsive in the beginning, but I will um, open up the box later in the presentation. So we've got a few slides with prepared content and just explaining how we look at investments. I know a lot of you are familiar with real estate and probably own some form of real estate or were invested in some type of deal. Um, our company does multifamily investing and we focus on using the joint venture model, the JV model, instead of doing syndications. Uh, we want to attract folks to our company that are interested in more than just collecting passive income from the deal. So if you actually want to learn how to operate, and I know a lot of people with STEM backgrounds are interested in that, we wanted to create a model that actually worked for folks in that space. And so today we'll be running through the differences between JVs and syndications. Uh, what I see as roadblocks to getting into multifamily. Um, and then I'll use myself as a case study on how the roadblocks and hurdles that I went through in order to get into the space, um, share with you my biggest mistakes in an effort to make sure that you avoid them. Just that's my piece or trying to give you guys as much value as I can in this space and this opportunity. We'll follow that up with some free resources in case you guys want to learn some more and do Q&A and then we'll wrap it up and send everybody on their way. Um, and just a disclaimer, I'm not an attorney, I'm not a CPA. And so this is just education and you should go speak to somebody about your specific situation um, and not try to go act on this stuff without uh, specific guidance. And so I think about syndications and JVs and I try to use metaphors to illustrate my points. And so when I think about a syndication, I think about a jumbo jet. You've got the pilot, the co-pilot and the stewardess. And those folks are getting paid by the airline in order to operate the plane. And then you have the passengers on the plane. Those folks pay, they bought tickets or their relatives or whatever, but they pay to get on the plane in some way, shape or form. I liken this to a syndication. This GP, the general partnership, the people actually operating the deal are the pilot, the co-pilot and the stewardess. The limited partners pay to get on the plane. And why do I say they pay? I say they pay because a dollar into a syndication doesn't equal a dollar worth of equity. It usually is reduced by 20 or 30 cents per dollar or 20 or 30 percent from an ownership standpoint. That 20 to 30 percent goes to compensate people for finding the deal, signing the loans, qualifying for the loan and just the general operations of the opportunity. Um, and so I, I get a little extreme when I, I talk to people about being limited partners and I say, hey, you're just buying an illiquid security. So why don't you just go buy a REIT if you want to be invested in real estate, but just get the money passively. And some people have a visceral reaction to it. But, you know, if you're getting very similar to returns to what you would by owning a REIT or owning a stock, I'm not certain why people would want to put their money into that space. And so um, it's not a criticism. It's just a point of, um, I guess, clarification in the discussion. And so then you know, when I think about joint ventures, I consider them to be something similar to a fighter pilot or a fighter jet, right? You got the pilot, you got the co-pilot, but there isn't any room for people just to be along for the ride. There aren't any passengers in this journey. And so when you set up a joint venture or you go into a joint venture project, everybody has an active role. And that is the real difference between a JV and a syndication. Everybody's responsible for delivering the result. Um, everybody has the opportunity to vote, but it doesn't stop there. They have a bigger voice. They have a bigger responsibility to the overall uh, contribution or the overall outcome of the project. Each individual should be able to demonstrate how they completed their work. And 
the biggest and best thing, and I, I guess these are the same between a syndication and a joint venture, but I think it's really important here, is you're becoming a partner in a business, right? If you're in a GP in a syndication, you're in a partner, you're actually involved in the operations. On the flip side, um, if you're a limited partner, you just have your money in the deal. You don't have a voice. You don't have an opportunity to say anything. With the people in the JV, everybody has a part. That everybody has a voice. And so, you know, you're getting into business. And I think that's really important when you think about what it takes to execute some of these deals. And so here's the side-by-side -side comparison. Um, it's easier to get a, the experience box check with a joint venture because the expectation is that you have an a, a active role. In addition to that, the majority of people are going to own like over 20% of the deal. And so if you go out and get a recourse loan, the bank's going to expect you to sign, right? There's usually a personal guarantee if you buy something under a million dollars. And so in that space, you can now go back to the bank on another deal and say, hey, I've signed a commercial loan. And because I've signed that commercial loan, I have experience in operating a multifamily opportunity or if it's office or whatever the asset class is. Um, and that we'll talk about a little bit later, but that was my one of my biggest hurdles when I was trying to get into the space. Um, you have voting rights as long as you're in the JV. Um, more deals are available in the JV space. And so what I see a JV doing is tackling some of the smaller deals. I, I think there's a lot of groups out there that want to go take down the stuff that's 200 or better. I think that's probably institutional money. If you go to a lot of the different educators around the country, they're going to tell you to buy 100 or more. But I think the real opportunity, the biggest pond, is all those properties that are less than 100 units. And probably more specifically, less than 75 units. And so those smaller deals, and not all of them will be under a million dollars, but just when you go and look at them, there's more of them in the marketplace compared to what I would call wells, right? Um, you can t the JVs are better set up to take investments from sophisticated investors. And so everybody who invests feels like they're pretty sophisticated. Um, this is probably one of the things that kind of scares me the most about investing is this really gray area around sophisticated or non-accredited investors. Um, so that's anybody who isn't making income over 250 for the past two years and expecting to do so this year. And it's for people who don't have over a million dollars net worth, excluding their primary residence. Those folks um, are in the same phase of life I am, where you're building wealth and you're trying to grow and you don't just want to rely on the stock market to do it. And so when it comes to syndication, what I've seen is a number of different syndicators say, hey, we only focus on accredited investors. Um, and it, it makes their business more efficient and it makes it easier for them to raise capital because they can advertise and do a bunch of other stuff where, you know, my network, I, I went, I'm the son of a soldier. I went to public schools my entire education. And so, you know, my network isn't going to come from you know, a wealthy family for the most part. Like everybody's in the process of building their own fortune. For the joint ventures, the deal lead experience may be weaker. Well, why would you list that as a pro? Because you actually have a voice. When people get a ton of experience, they want to run the deal the way they want to run the deal, and it's usually based on whatever worked for them in the past. When you have somebody who has a little less experience, they're usually a little more open, a little more collaborative, and interested in showing people what they know and having these discussions about what the right approach is. Um, and so that's why I list that as a pro um, from the less experience, because you get the opportunity to have more input. Uh, more value add opportunity on a percentage basis. So what we see is with these smaller properties, you can force the value to go up more, usually because they're being operated by somebody who's a little less sophisticated in operations of an apartment business. And so if you can come in with a great strategy and execute that strategy, um, you can, for instance, we bought a deal where market rents were at a, over $1,000 a month, we bought that, but it was operating at less than $700 a month in collected rent. So we came in, we executed our business plan, and now we're getting $1,195 at that property um, compared to the $695 when we took it over. And so that is a huge, on a percentage basis, that's a huge amount. When you're dealing with the larger properties, you got better property management in essence, and 
those percentages or those gaps are usually not as wide. And so on a percentage basis, even on a, if it's not on a dollar basis, you're able to make greater gains on these joint venture projects. The cons with the joint ventures, um, there's less resolution on vacancy. And so if we talk about somebody having a single family home and renting it out, well, you know, you're either at 100% occupancy or zero. Uh, with a 10 unit, you're either at, you can be, you know, 90%, 80%, 70% on down to zero. Uh, with a 100 unit, you can be at 99% on down to zero. And so, you know, the bigger it gets, the more resolution you have on your vacancy when you have somebody move out. And so it, we, if the assumption is the joint ventures work on the smaller deals, then you're going to have less resolution of vacancy. Uh, the property managers aren't as sophisticated. Usually they're, you know, smaller shops, you know, it's an operator and then three, four or five people on their staff. Instead of having these massive groups and having people on properties, um, you know, they've got a central hub and they're managing um, scattered site locations, even if there's 20 or 30 or 50 doors at a particular location. Um, Everybody that I talk to that owns the larger properties say that the smaller properties are more difficult to manage. And so we have to list that. I don't know that that is actually true and I don't even know how people can actually prove that out. But I do know that the general consensus is that it's harder to manage a smaller property. Um, we talked about recourse debt a little bit earlier, but that kind of jumps on both sides, right? If you haven't signed a loan and you wanna go do an apartment deal, then you go to a bank, the bank's going to ask you if you've ever signed a loan before. And if the answer is no, they're not going to lend. And so you've got, in order to sign with these smaller loans, um, you're going to have some form of recourse debt, at least initially. Part of our business model is to buy stuff with recourse debt so that we can refi out into more permanent debt and not have to deal with any of the prepayment penalties and some of the other stuff that comes with that type of financing. On the syndication model, um, you know, pros, you work with experienced investors. Uh, most of the folks that are able to do these have um, considerable experience investing and evaluating deals. Um, you have more resolution on your vacancies just by virtue of having more doors. The property managers have systems in place. They're usually a little more sophisticated. Um, their staff's probably a little better educated and, you know, those things come into play as you're dealing with a bigger machine. Um, there's economy of scales, right? So because you've got more doors at the same site, you can hire a full-time person just to be there to manage that. You can hire a maintenance person just to be there to manage that and trying to sped them around to different properties. Um, Non-recourse debt is always uh, pretty favorable and desirable. Cons, the, the, from my perspective, you know, it leans towards accredited investors. You know, the majority of my network is not accredited and so them wanting to get into a deal they would be excluded if our business model was focused on accredited investors. Um, you have no vote as a limited partner. Of course, if you have a figure out a way to get into a general partnership and the GP, then you get the opportunity to have a voice. But if you're just putting your money in a deal, you don't have any um, voice. Um, if you're a limited partner, in a deal, yeah, it's great to say, hey, I own 200 units or I own 400 units. Um, but that doesn't count as experience because you didn't sign the loan. And then I think the last thing is there's fewer deals. And so, you know, it's pretty aggressive. You know, it's extremely a tight market. There's a lot of people going into Texas and um, Florida and all these other markets. And so there's a lot of people competing for deals and it's bidding the prices up and people are paying more for stuff than what they actually desire to pay. And so uh, I think everybody's probably read the purple, little purple book, right? Um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And so I pulled the cash flow quadrant out just to talk about it real quick from the way that we look at um, investing. And so over here we have the employee, right? And you have some type of job. And this is all specifically related to real estate investing, right? And so the employee in the hierarchy is going to be the community manager, the person that's responsible for the day-to-day -day actions at the property. Um, for self-employed, it would be the property manager. And so it's his company, you know, they probably go to the office every day, they're managing their staff, but the business won't run without them actually being a part of it. Then there's the business owner or what I consider joint venture partners, right? And so if 
you know, we connect on LinkedIn, you'll see that my tagline says I buy broken apartment building businesses. And the business is the operative word. Um, it's not so much the property as it is the revenue that's generated from the property and the services rendered by the property. And so that's where the joint venture partners go. And then for the investor piece, um, you know, passive investors are investors. And this really goes to, hey, if you're going to be a limited partner in syndication, then this is where you fit. Um, I think that the majority of people make their money here in the business quadrant or the business owner quadrant, and then they invest it here. And so you amass your wealth here and then you invest it there passively. Um, and, you know, I, I think the opportunity to have more control over your money and be able to push the income is pretty important. So let's use me as a case study. And so, you know, we created this financial movement called A Thousand Doors and Hundred People. And so it's our strategy, our mission to buy a thousand doors over the next few years. And basically we want to buy at a pace of about a hundred doors a year and partner with about a hundred people all over the country who are interested in finding and creating income by buying businesses, repositioning them and enjoying the cash flow during that and then enjoy participating in the upside when we sell it. Um, yeah, I, I'm a full-time real estate investor. Um, I help co-host a podcast called Dreamcatchers. Um, we got some real estate education through our Myers Methods brand. Um, our actual operating company for our real estate portfolio is called the Myers Development Group. And then for the folks who want to do work on themselves, we do some uh, peak performance coaching through our Dreamcatchers brand. And so if I had to tell somebody what I do on a daily basis, I'm either working on property or people. And so I develop people in places. I'm a licensed general contractor in two states. I'm a project management professional. I've got a Six Sigma Master Black Belt, and I'm a professional engineer in three or four states. Um, so right now, I'm the asset manager for approximately 90 units between North Carolina and Virginia. And my target market right now is Greensboro, North Carolina. We just continue to buy and buy. And we really want to be the major player in that market as the our ownership in that space grows. Um, we created a method for buying the properties. It's called the Myers Methods of Multifamily Analysis. Um, we find the deals, we fund them, we fix them, and then we flip them. Um, and flipping them can be two things. It can either be a refinance or it can be selling the deal to somebody else. And both make sense. We like to buy things where we can refinance out in the first five years, all the original money that was put in, and then enjoy the cash flow until we get to a place where we're ready to diverse, divest the asset. And we feel like the majority of people would be pretty excited about being able to have an affinity cash flow or an affinity return on the money that they put into a deal. Um, we've got a hundred unit development in process in Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, that project's called Technology Row. We're so stoked about it. Before I jumped on with you guys, I was on a call with one of my partners from Minneapolis. Um, and I guess my last job in corporate America, I was employee number two in a division that was starting a new project. And over eight months or so, we went from two employees to 170 and by the end of the year we made about 20 million dollars in revenue um, and then we did it again the next year with a pretty high profit margin about 30 percent and today you know we've raised about a million dollars in capital i think that number is probably a little low but we just put it in for the sake of giving you guys a point of reference um just my investment strategy and this will become more important a little bit later in the conversation but we believe in altruistic investment so i think you can do good while doing well i don't think having a laser focus on just making profit is the right answer we actually want to improve the community with our projects and so we may not buy the project that you're going to make the most money on just to make as much money as we can we want to improve the environment. What, what we've realized in our due diligence inspections is we are entering the most personal space in the environment that people spend the most time in. And so it, we feel like it's our responsibility to make sure that we hold up our end of the bargain as an owner and provide a quality place for the folks to live. That doesn't mean that we do things that don't make sense, but we do want to preserve the property and keep it in great shape. Um, we had uh, just three quick scenarios on shocks and due diligence. And so the first one, we were buying a property in Greensboro and we went to walk through one of the units and there was a lady and she had two babies on her hips and then a toddler standing beside her and her 
partner was also in the house and we get in and there's this really strong smell and we couldn't figure out what was going on well we get into the kitchen and the kitchen sink hasn't worked for two or three months and so the water's just sitting there and so in order for them to drain the kitchen sink they were taking a pot or a cup and scooping the water out of the sink after doing whatever they needed to do with it like um you know washing dishes or cleaning the floors or whatever they were doing and they were scooping the water out and then dumping it out the back door because the landlord wouldn't come in and actually do the maintenance ticket and that really hit home for us as far as you know people don't deserve to live with that it doesn't matter what's going on if they don't want to pay their rent then you evict them but you don't force them to live in substandard conditions um, and you know I've got two daughters so it was really impactful for me to have that experience um, sewage backup so we bought another property in Richmond Virginia and one of the buildings had settled and so when we were going through due diligence we saw that there were um, some spillage coming from the kitchen sinks onto the cabinets and they were being ruined and we didn't really understand what was going on until after we bought it and we found out that the building had settled so much that it was it caused the pipe not to work as it was supposed to and in that the residents were having um, sewage from the toilets back up into the showers and the kitchen sinks and at times overflowing. And so that was just like another one of those things, like how do you as an owner, because you know this is happening and he didn't share that with us, but how do you as an owner get okay with, you know, running a property that way? And so, you know, that was one of the first things we fixed, of course. And then I guess the last thing is that same property, um, there was a laundry room there and these people who live there didn't have transportation. And so when we walked into their unit and got up into the, looked in the bedrooms and we could see it just looked like there were mud caked on the sheets in the little girl's bedroom. And so when we asked what was going on or what, what had happened, uh, the conversation was, hey, the owner hasn't fixed the laundry room, so we don't have a car to take our stuff to go get washed. Um, and we're just waiting for the laundry room to get fixed. And I mean, it had been like a couple of months. And so, you know, you wrap all that up and you realize that you're not just in this thing to make money, but you're actually impacting people's lives. And so that's part of the reason why it shaped our philosophy and why we want to be active in the operation of the apartment. We want to be able to shape the strategy that goes into um, running these buildings. And we may make an investment here or there that maybe isn't the most cost prudent thing to do. But when you look at the entire picture, it makes sense and the improving the community standpoint. And so I think the four most common challenges for getting in a multifamily, knowledge, deal flow, capital, or access to capital, and the experience check box is the one that I think is probably the most difficult. Um, so how I got started. You know, I had a huge knowledge gap. I was doing something completely unrelated. I, I didn't have any property management experience. Um, you know, my deepest foray into real estate investing was lending money to fix and flip lend, or flip, fix and flippers or rehabbers or, you know, people who do the stuff that you see on HGTV. And I was just like, why don't you care about um, paying me these high interest rates? It's like, because it's a, just a cost of doing business and it's a fraction of what I'm making. And so I was like, man, that's pretty cool but I don't think I actually want to do that because it's a real job. And so when I came to the multifamily space, I was like, well, how do I get educated? And so I listened to a ton of podcasts. I started reading books. I went to YouTube U. I think I'm a graduate actually. And then I also go to the local RIA, but my local RIA never, ever, ever talked about multifamily real estate. So I was like, okay, well, how do I actually get into it? Um, and I, I went to the extreme, right? I, I listen to about 40 hours of content related to real estate or some type of development each week. And so most days I would hear something from one person that conflicted from the day before or two weeks ago, and I didn't know what I was doing. Um, it, it just wasn't cohesive. It wasn't good for me. So um, instead of just staying confused, I just added more content. And then eventually I felt overwhelmed. And then when I thought I had it, I would be overconfident. It's like, oh yeah, I got this, I know what I'm doing. And then when something showed up that showed me that I didn't actually know what I was doing, I got frustrated. And I don't know how many of you are actually out there that are going through the same things, but um, having a single source for your baseline is a really, really efficient way for you to speed up the learning process. Um, deal flow, right? 
how did how, how did you find how did I find those? I, I started on LoopNet. Um, I found stuff in places that didn't make sense in the grand scheme of things, but I didn't know that when I was just getting started. I was just, you know, shooting at whatever I could and seeing if anybody would sign up to help me do it. And fortunately, the bank stopped me from doing a lot of stuff that I wanted to do. Um, I used some direct mail letters to try to get in front of people that weren't um, listing on LoopNet and just seeing if they would, you know, passively consider an offer. And then I started getting into networking. but. The thing for me is, my in the areas that I was in, there weren't any multifamily specific stuff. Now I know that there's stuff on Facebook, there's stuff on LinkedIn. Um, you can jump on Meetup.com, and stuff is better organized. But back when I started, those things weren't available. Um, capital. So you know, I, having I had some savings outside of 401k, so I, I was good there. I also had access to credit lines if I needed to grow. Um, I had some money in whole life policy because I wanted to do the infinite banking model. And then I used my W-2 to qualify for loans from the last year I was working. And then I, I guess the rest of that money that we used to go into our initial deals came from friends and family. Um, and so I think everybody on this call at least can use the last three. And then, you know, if you haven't been saving or have access to credit lines, I think you guys can absolutely go explore those options as well. Um, the, but the big one, the experience was something that I didn't have. Um, you know, in order to say you have experience in multifamily investing, you, you've got to personally guarantee a loan or at least sign a loan somewhere. And I went to 10 different banks and uh, we talked about my corporate experience. We, we talked about my MBA. We talked about my different certifications and none of that mattered. And so I didn't know what I was going to do. And so what did I end up doing? Uh, when I realized I wasn't going to get a multifamily because I didn't have access to the my biggest partner, the 80% partner, the bank, the debt, um, I went and started fixing and flipping houses because I wanted to still stay in the space and not go back into corporate America. Um, and so the other option when the banks wasn't weren't willing to lend was to go get hard money. Um, and some people call it bridge financing, other people call it hard money, some people call it private money, just depending on the interest rate. But the fact of the matter was that those rates were so high that for a buy and hold strategy, there wasn't a left meat on the bone for us to actually make the deal work or at least be conservatively. Um, at that juncture, I didn't know what a self-directed IRA was. And so, um, I didn't have access to any private money lenders and I didn't know anyone that owned multifamily. What I should have done, I should have went to conferences. Uh, maybe I should have taken a course and had I really understood like the different social media groups, um, joining one of those uh, probably would have helped me grow my network. But I think the conf I put the conferences first here and I guess courses is probably a course second, but um, you know, with the conferences, you actually get to meet people who are doing it. And they're, they're only there for one or two reasons. Either they're speaking and they got paid to, or they're looking to grow their business. And they're looking for other people to do that with. Either they're looking for deals or they're looking for other partners. And so, you know, going to conferences, I think, is one of the best ways that you can expand your network. And I throw meetups in with the conferences because it's still a similar thing where you got a speaker, but you're going to network. Um, my most costly mistakes, and I alluded to it a little bit earlier, but I think the most inefficient and ineffective thing you can do is try to consume the content from all of the different podcasters and YouTube blog vloggers out there um, in an effort to create your own course. Um, I think it makes a ton of sense to get somebody to curate the content for you so that you're not hearing a bunch of conflicting opinions. Not to say that you can't decipher it. I'm just telling you that there's a ton of time that I wasted. You know, if, if you listen to 40 hours of content and you only get, let's say I only got four hours of good content out of that, 90% of the time I spent listening to content wasn't uh, productive. And so um, I, I just I encourage people to get a solid base. And then once you understand your base, supplement your base. Um, I made some modeling mistakes because, you know, I, I was self-taught on the modeling. Um, I, I remember buying a property for, um, I, I modeled the property where my property taxes were $1,000, right? And, and at the end of the year, they were ended up being $10,000. Um, 
it's a rounding error, but it was a big one and it made a huge impact on what our reserve account looked like. Um, underestimating rehab budgets. Um, so if anybody's done fix and flip and they're ready to make that transition in a multifamily um, and you've got confidence in your ability to estimate a budget, just know that if you underestimate something like say an HVAC system by you know $2,000 um, and you got a 25 unit, that's half a million dollars. Um, and so, you know, just make sure that your your number you're tied on your numbers because they, it can be it can lead to huge huge cost overruns when you start multiplying by um, you know these double digits. And I think that probably the one of the most embarrassing mistakes that I've made is not properly vetting my property manager. So the first person that I hired to manage our properties was a member of the RIA. Um, I'd seen him for a long time. And I thought we were on the same page. I thought we had the same values. And very soon after they took over the property, I realized we're not the same people. Um, and they didn't have a, the same focus on execution that I did, and nor did they treat my money the same way I would expect them to treat theirs. And so we ended up, I, and foolishly, I signed a, uh, a management contract where there was an early termination clause. And I thought there would be no issue terminating it if they didn't do a good job. And sure enough, they executed the early termination clause and I ended up paying two property managers for a quarter because I wasn't satisfied with what the other property manager was doing. And even after giving them the feedback on things I wanted to change, we just kind of moved the ball around. It was kind of like a shell game. And so, you know, had I been in somebody else's deal and didn't have a voice, then I would just have to ride that out. But because I was in deal with my friends, we talked about it and made a decision and that's what we did. We, we ate that cost. Um, so here's 10 reasons, and I think this is kind of, kind of wrapping it up. Here's 10 reasons why we prefer joint ventures. We talked about defining a business plan already um, to get experience. If you're not, if you haven't found a way into a general partnership in a syndication, then you're not getting experience. You're just, um, putting your money in an illiquid security from our perspective. Um, be more involved in operational decisions. If you actually want to learn how to run the business, then a joint venture is the way to go. Um, give access to investors who aren't already wealthy. And so when I say wealthy, I mean accredited, right? And so it's my ambition to open the door to more people because I think this is a really amazing way to create intergenerational wealth as well as freedom of, for people. And so the more people that I can help get into the space, the better off I think the world will be because they're not just doing work for comp anymore. They can actually do work that they're passionate about because their life is taken care of from their properties that they invest in. And it doesn't end up being a all consuming full time job to, in order to, um, at least in the typical traditional sense, when we think of work. Um, we like joint ventures because we're looking at more deals than um, you would be able to look at from a syndication perspective. And, you know, one of my mentors, he and his father just did a joint venture on a $50 million deal. It was just the two of them in the deal. Um, so joint ventures don't preclude you from doing the big deals. It's just a matter of access to the right resources in order to do that. Um, when you're looking at the smaller deals, there's less full-time competition. And so if I'm competing with an attorney or if I'm competing with a dentist or a doctor for a deal, um, you know, they have to take time off, but they're chair side. They have to be at a specific place at a specific time. Um, if a broker calls me with a deal, it's my desire to tour the property first, be the first to submit a, a letter of intent and have that property under contract before anybody else can get to it. And so being full time in this business gives me that opportunity. Um, I like the idea of the baby boomers who are exiting and wanting to retire and you know they've put their savings into this business being able to help them get out they exit they probably exit a little bit less than what um they wanted to but and we get a great deal but they get out they don't have to spend a bunch of time marketing it um and i think that's a win-win for both sides um, with the smaller deal there's less risk if something goes terribly wrong um you know if you own a 500 unit building uh, and the market goes bad because employers start laying off and so on and so forth, um, you, there's, there's a ton of risk there. 
Um, if there's a 50 unit, you can figure it out. If it's a five unit, because that would still be a commercial loan, you can probably figure that out and just swallow it and keep on going. Um, I think when we do joint ventures, we expand our network. Uh, it's always interesting to hear the guys that do syndication talk about, hey, this person sent $100,000 or $250,000 in and I've never talked to them because my funnel's great. Um, I actually want to know the people that I'm working with. I don't just want their money. In fact, I won't take people's money if they can't bring some type of intellectual horsepower to the deal. And so, you know, it's just a philo philosophical difference on how you have people invest and participate in the deal. Um, and I think the last thing is there's more people looking for the lower value deals because there's more people that have access to that capital. As you get higher in the stack of um, price points, there's less people that actually have access to the capital in order to close those deals. And so, you know, we, we want to have multiple options. Is it going to be the same as single family? Absolutely not. Um, you're still going to be dealing with more and more sophisticated investors, but you know, there's more people that can actually take that down than one of the huge deals. And so we like that space, especially for people early in their multifamily investing career. And so just a couple of free resources um, on our website, MyersMethods.com, we've got a free four pager that dives into this a little bit deeper and talks more about our philosophy. Um, there's also a 15 minute podcast that goes with it that where we go you know, point by point and also help people figure out how to get into the space. And then I would really, 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 really appreciate you guys going and checking out our podcast, Dreamcatchers. Um, it's on YouTube. We've got the video version on YouTube and then anywhere where you would listen to um, the podcast, um, that is, um, it's available there. So iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, you name it, we're on it. Um, and you just check us out. Um, and ratings and reviews and shares are extremely appreciated. We want to grow um, the listenership and um, let more people hear the stories of ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Oh, man. That's... I just saw the notes. I'm sorry, guys. Um, so I, I, I guess I can, well, Daniel, you have the presentation. I guess you can just send it to him. Um, sorry about that. Um, can we, oh, yeah. Sorry about that, guys. Um, any questions? I'm, I'm sorry you couldn't see the pictures. This is Michelle. Yes, this is Myers Methods. So M Y E R S M E T H O D S on IG. Can you? Am I coming across sound wise? I, I can hear you, but I don't think Jerome can. Uh, I'll write it. Awesome. Thanks, Michelle. Oh, and that reminds me. So we're having a conference, guys. Um, March 20th at 6 p.m. is when we're starting. And we're going till noon on the 22nd. Um, One group. Would love, love, love to have you guys come and, and share with us. We're, we're talking everything multifamily. With it. Um, I was going to do the. Interview. I don't know if I can right. add an attachment in this chat, but uh, if, um, Daniel, I'll, I'll send you the flyer, and maybe you could share it with the folks that came if they're interested, or no, um, yeah. if you guys have. Um, I, I don't know if you connect with me on LinkedIn or any other um, social media platform. I send you my personal um, email. Get the info to you. Uh, email that I send you. But, um, I would love, love, love to have you guys come out. And, I try. Yeah, I don't. Wish some more about syndications and JVs and um, get excited about multifamily because I mean for me that I'm, I'm placing my bet completely on that
I did all that talking and it was no questions. Any questions for the group? Drum just sent uh, the photo over. Uh, he sent it to me through Facebook. All right. Okay. I saw Michelle typing. I didn't see it finished, though. Daniel, I just sent you our preliminary schedule and our speaker deal via Facebook. Sure, Jane. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Jane. I would love to hear more about you guys. I am. I'm just going to be traveling to the airport, but it's good. Okay, for everybody who can hear me, next week we have Travis Watts. Travis Watts is a full-time passive real estate investor. He does none of his own act deals actively, but invests in other people's deals. Uh, he's also the main communications coordinator for Ashcroft Capital which owns approximately 900 million in real estate currently. And so uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing from him and uh, I hope you are too. So we'll see you here next week at, uh, at on Friday at noon. Um, so I'm just gonna say Sid cause I don't wanna mess up the rest of your name. So Michael Blank, um, Jake and Gino, um, were my two favorite, Joe Fairless and Whitney Sewell, John Kasman, um, Will Smith's doing a really nice podcast. There's a couple of guys from Out Your Way, um, Multifamily Takeoff. They're doing a really, really nice product. They're pretty new, though. I think they're in their first five episodes. Um... My friend, um, Van Kant, um, Pankaj Sharma is doing something called Sharma's Karma, where they're breaking down their family business. They've built a f over 4,000 unit portfolio that's held within their family. And the first four episodes are just family members where they're talking about the stories and I mean, family members and close uh, people to the business where they're just talking about that. And that is on YouTube. Great quality content, about 45 minute episodes. If you go to Myers Method, Jane, if you go to MyersMethods.com, um, it's a free giveaway. Yes, it's up to date. Sorry. Intel Blocks is web page. Yeah, you know, it's like those security I messages. I was on it, uh, <laughs> this morning. <laughs> I might have broken it, Ulysses. We do have a Myers Methods YouTube, Jane. Thank you for pointing that out. I try not to overwhelm people. If nobody else has any questions, we'll end the meeting a little bit early.
Thank you, everybody. Be here. I appreciate the opportunity to share with you guys. Thank you, Cecilia, Jay. Sid, let's connect, man. Ash Hook.